everyone. It's Kathleen Byers. Um, today's broadcast is a topic that um, hopefully has gotten everyone's attention and something that we all talk about a lot, which is how do you how do you earn more and work less? I think it's like the riddle we're all trying to solve, right? I mean, when you're first graduating college, you might have or had two jobs to make ends meet. You're like, oh, I can't wait till I earn more money so I can work less. And um, so, so let's dig into that topic today because we've got some solutions and something that I discovered um, years ago that really was a game changer in my own life in, in, in creating this for myself. Um, I was a single mother at a very um, young age. And because of that, I, I had this additional responsibility and this additional um, you know, wonderful um, um, responsibility on my time, which is my daughter, right? And so for me to come up through the ranks of my career, I really had to find a way how can I, um, how can I continue to earn more and work less, right? And it took me a long time to figure this out. <laughs> the first 12 years of my career I was not successful at this. Um, and then it took probably about five, eight years of, of trial and error research after that to figure this out. But what we have discovered, and this is really powerful, is when you are saying, I want to, I want to work less, but earn more. First of all, and you guys have heard me talk about this over and over again, is you have to believe it's possible. Okay. So if you're, if, if you're wiring, if you're, if you're buying into this concept that, you know, we have to sacrifice or only people who sacrifice can earn a lot. Wow. You know, this is an amazing um, wealthy person, but oh, I wouldn't want their life because look at how much they have to sacrifice. Like if you are, if you've bought into that, then that's going to be your reality. Okay. So the very first thing you have to do is you have to say, I want to earn a living. That's really comfortable for myself um, doing something that I truly love and that doesn't eat up all my personal time. It's that simple, right? And so once you make that decision, obviously, then this allows you to sort of move forward. But, um, and thank you for everyone who's coming to the broadcast today and listening in. So what you really wanna do is recognize a couple of things. Um, everything that we teach is steeped in science and the science of human behavior. And what's really amazing about this is once you start looking outside yourself for answers, you actually get, you know, what I call the keys to the kingdom. You're able to move throughout your life with more freedom, with more impact and with more influence. Okay. So one of the things that we teach is we teach um, our clients how to understand their human behavior so that A, they can start understanding how to really keep themselves at a peak performance level, that they keep themselves balanced, that they're giving each of their needs the right amount of attention with effective strategies. Well, guess what? If you have human needs, Everyone else has human needs, okay? We also teach our clients, and I've talked to you about this before, this fear-based psychology that we have. Well, once we start to eliminate that fear-based psychology, you have to recognize that other people have fear-based psychology that's working against them, okay? So what does all this have to do with earning more and working less? Well, a couple of things. One is when we remove that fear-based psychology and we're no longer operating from a place of you know, fearing that we're gonna lose our place at the table, it allows you just to make decisions that say, hey, you know what? I'm actually going home right now, right? Like that's the first thing. But how do you keep moving up the ladder in, in earning more? Because what, when we put in a lot of boundaries and we're constantly saying, no, 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 I can't be there. That doesn't really conducive <laughs> to moving up into your, your career and becoming you know, more relied upon as a leader or executive or whatever it is that you're doing. And so what you really have to start doing is understanding what's going on with the people around you. And again, you've got to stop looking inside yourself and start looking outside. So for example, what we do traditionally is, is a project comes onto our plate, okay, in the office, um, an assignment, a new team member, whatever it is. And we, we, we automatically, because of our psychology, start um, um, internalizing it. How am I going to get this done? What do I need to do to succeed? I, 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 right? And what we want to do instead is when we see a project coming across your plate, say, okay, great. Why was I given this project? What's important to that person who assigned it to me? What's important to the other team members, the other stakeholders? And so my immediate reaction is no longer, oh my God, what do I need to do? How am I going to perform? How am I going to be a success? How am I not going to fail? Which is all that eternal fear-based psychology. My first reaction is, hmm, interesting. I wonder why they asked me to do it. I wonder what's important to them. And I'm just looking at that as I look around the room or whatever's going on in this scenario. And I'm asking questions too. I may not know, right? I mean, once you start learning a little bit more about your need, your human needs, you can, you can 
create better guesstimates about what's going on for someone else and what need they're trying to meet by assigning you this project, for example. Um, but I'm asking, okay, great. So what's important to you here? Is this going to help you personally with X or you personally with Y? Like I am asking those questions many times of my boss, my leadership team, my clients, right? Why is this important to you? What's the objective here? And when I listen to what they say in the objective or what they're trying to meet, I'm thinking, hmm, why is that important to them? What's going on in their psychology, right? Because if I can help them get their needs met and help them understand and feel comfortable with how we're going to proceed, well, guess who gets to create the, the, the strategy for how we're going to move forward? I do, right? Okay, so let me give you an example. Um, years ago, I went to work for a company um, as a one of their first uh, sort of, I guess, management team. They had never had a management team before. It was a smaller company, tremendously cool company to work for. Did got to do some phenomenal work there. And it was a um, very traditional butts and seats, you know, 8.30 in the morning to five at night. And it was very, you know, that was it. Like everyone kind of went home at five and then the, um, the leadership of the company, the ownership of the company, they would work after hours, but they didn't necessarily expect their team to, but it was butts and seats, 8.30 to five. And to be really honest, um, I have never been good <laughs> with structure in my environment. So that was gonna be a struggle for me. And so I did it um, for a few weeks and I even remember there was one day I was running late and I didn't even bother to call in because I'm like, I'm in management. Like, do I really have to call if I'm late? And I think it was like the chief operating officer called me and asked me where I was. I was like, oh my God. So <laughs> I was like, they're serious about the schedule, right? 8.30 to five. And anyway, so, so here's a perfect example though. But as I'm getting my feet wet in this company and I'm looking around the room, I'm looking at what really is going on here because I may be hired, for example, to do marketing, which is my expertise. And there's certain goals and, and, and benchmarks I need to achieve to be successful in the role and according to the marketing execution, right, and strategy. But what's really going on here? And what I started to notice as I was sitting in these different staff meetings is we had a really um, visionary leader, sort of like a Steve Jobs type of leader that owned the company. And then we had a lot of people who were really subject matter experts at executing his vision, but there was no one to ever challenge his vision. And again, coming out of the, the environment I did in the training I had, I was like, it, it's, it's hard for me to not challenge someone's vision because I, I really feel like that's why I'm in the room. You, you've, you've hired me to be someone who asks questions, is curious, and tries to evolve ideas. So I thought this, this person, this leader really needs that. This is missing for him. And I started lobbying new ideas and, you know, and providing that devil's advocate um, piece in all of these staff meetings. Now, others were looking around thinking, wow, she's confrontational. She's challenging the status quo. She's not just doing what he says. And I'm thinking, right, because this is what he needs. This has nothing to do with my job. It's nothing to do with building a website or creating lead flow or all these other stuff that marketing does, right? I am recognized that there's a leader of this company that has a really strong need for a partnership with someone, for a sounding board with someone, for someone else. He is lonely at the top, right? Like this sucks to be the only person spewing vision, spewing strategy, coming up with solutions. He needed a partner in that solution process, okay? And as I started fulfilling that for him, both in these um, uh, meetings, as well as there were times I would drop by his office and say like, hey, how do you think that meeting went? What are you feeling about this now? What are your thoughts on this? I'm seeing this, are you seeing this? And so what I'm doing is really creating dialogue and this deep engagement with his needs, also understanding his scripts, where his ego is and some of these things that are going on for him too. And I'm speaking to that. And what happens is you start to create trust in your leadership team and your stakeholders and the people around you. And there's such a pricelessness in that because in over a very short period of time, I think I worked this 8.30 to 5 schedule for, I don't know, two or three months as I was getting to know the company and this, this leadership. And then I started saying, hey, you know, what? I'm going to be in tomorrow at nine. Hey, I'm going to leave tomorrow at three. Hey, I'm going to work from home. And very quickly, I was able to just rescope how I was going to approach my work. And it was not a huge issue because I had created this, this pricelessness of, look, of knowing, look, I'm going to rescope how I work but I know what you really need, it's over here. And I understand how you want us to get there because that's gonna help serve your psychology. I'm not saying that, I'm just talking to that, right? And other people just start to relax and go, oh my God, she just gets me. Or I don't know why, whenever she's in the room, I just feel comfortable or I'm totally confident in her. 
they don't know why they feel confident in you sometimes. They just do, right? And it's because you were understanding how to serve their human needs, not just the project outcome or your job outcome. Does that make sense? And so what's really empowering is once you start using this, this understanding of people, understanding of human nature to navigate your career, um, and you've removed this fear-based psychology, you know, now you're walking into whatever, a huge presentation. And instead of being like, oh my God, I hope I don't screw up. I hope I make the sale or whatever's going on. You're thinking, wow, what do these people in this room need? Are they ego-driven? Are they purpose-driven? Are they freedom-driven? What's important to them? What's happened recently in their lives? And I'm asking these questions as I build relationships with clients and team members, um, leadership, you know, stakeholders, I'm finding out who they are and listening to how they're responding because that's giving me a very authentic way to show up in a relationship with them that feels good. I'm not politicking. I'm not maneuvering. I'm not um, you know, holding things over their head or all these other things that you see people do, which they're strategies that can work. They're just not very effective over the long term. Instead, I'm going, wow, that guy over there, he must really be feeling shaky right now because I actually know that his last two projects kind of blew up on him and now he's been layered. This has got to be tough for him to sit in this room, huh? But he is an important stakeholder to me in my environment. How can I help him feel better about being in the room? What kind of things can I say? You know, and so you're just looking at people with empathy and with authenticity and helping them get their needs met and they immediately start to relax. The defenses and, the, and those things come down and now you are having this sort of priceless um, um, reputation, if you will, that people just enjoy being around you. They want you around. And when you need to ask for an extension of your vacation, some time to work from home, skipping out on a meeting, you know, Hey guys, like I do this a lot. I'll walk into a meeting and I'll see that it really is not relevant to me. And I'll be like, Hey guys, you know what? I'm about 15 minutes into this meeting. And it looks like for what, you know, we've been talking about, this is not something that I need to be directly involved in at this point. Um, I'm going to skip out because I've got some other things that really need to be attended to, but I look forward to the meeting notes or whatever, right? And so I'm just constantly navigating and buying myself time so I can optimize how I work and really get the fulfillment and the things done that my clients, my company, my boss, whatever need. And so in that particular instance I gave you from about 10 years ago, you know, very quickly, like I said, I was able to, I was the only person in this very traditional company that worked 835 that ever worked from home. Um, I originally started working from home every now and then. Then one time I worked from home for about three weeks. And then my husband and I, we got married, we had kids and I wanted to be home with my infant son more. So we had nanny, but I was just going into work in the morning. And then I was home with my baby every afternoon. And that was great. And I had my second son and I was like, Ooh, now I've got two kids. This is crazy. <laughs> I need to be home even more. I want to save on the commute. I want to be wearing t-shirt and shorts every day. I don't want to be putting makeup on every day. Like all those time hacks were really important to me by the time I had my second son. So once again, I'm talking to the leadership team of this company and saying, Hey, look, I understand what you want. We've worked together really well before I'm keeping in mind, you know, who you are and your needs. I'm meeting those. I need at this point in my life to just come in for the staff meeting on Tuesdays unless there's something urgent. Are you guys cool with that? Can we try it for a while? And we did. And I did that for like two, two years. And then I started going in a few mornings a week and stuff like that as my boys got older. Um, and so this is really how you can start controlling your workload while you continue to progress in your career is you've got to be looking around the room and helping other people meet their needs. And as you do that, people just like, oh, I want to promote her. I need her in mind. You know, I, I need her close to me. I want to promote her. You know, it's not just because she's getting things done, but she gets me. And they may not be able to voice it that way, but that's how they feel. This person understands me. They understand what needs to happen. They're very effective and efficient. And you are effective and efficient because you're very focused on helping that person meet their needs in the way you're getting your projects and your workload done. Does that make sense? Okay. So, um, so the so a great way to start doing this is just looking around the room. Who are those stakeholders that are affecting how you work? Noticing, am I showing up with a fear-based mentality? Like I'm so worried about what all these people think versus what do they need? Like if you've ever done um, um, public speaking training, one of the best things you can do is, and they teach you is like, look, it's not about you when you're on stage, right? It's about your audience. And so you got to stop focusing on you. That's why you're so nervous. And that's why you're scared and have all the jitters and want to vomit and all the stuff when you're public speaking, because everyone's worried, like, what if I mess up? What if I forget my speech? What if I trip? What if I sneeze? Blah, blah, blah. 
And so it's, it's just taking that same principle. And so when you walk into the boardroom, when you walk into your boss's office, it's not about like, oh, what does my boss want? What's going to happen? What do they think about me or whatever? I'm, I'm going, huh, I wonder what's going on for my boss. I wonder why they're feeling emotional. I wonder why they're upset. I wonder what's going on behind the scenes for why they're asking for this impossible task or whatever's going on. And I'm asking about that. So what are you saying? Are you saying this? Why is that important to you? What are you worried about? Are you worried about, you know, the latest shareholder meeting is that's what's driving this. I'm asking questions to figure out what's going on in their psychology, because once I know that, now I can come up with solutions that's going to help them feel good about the solution versus saying, oh, I need an extra week to do that. No, I got to go home at five and pick up my kids or whatever, right? Like nobody wants to hear that. They, people want to know that you understand them, that you're validating where they're at at this point in their life, and that you are going to work to help them achieve their needs. And when you do that, now you can be rescoping projects. Now you can be working in a different way. Now you can show up and say like, hey, I know I said we were going to do it this way, but now that we're three weeks in, I'm seeing that we're going to need more resources. But again, I'm saying that in a way that says, and in order for you to achieve your needs of making sure we don't have another shareholder meeting like that or whatever, um, this is why this is important. And when I'm tying that back into their psychology, their fears, their desires, it's a whole different playing field. It's a whole different ballgame. Does that make sense? Um, and so understanding who you're speaking with and what's important to them is like, is, is like the starting point. And so starting to show up in your meetings and showing up in your work, helping others focus on what they need. Like you'll see this a lot when you have um, a very dominating leader. If you work for someone, a boss who's very dominating or they use bullying tactics or they're just always asking for the impossible, right? And so what happens is a lot of times is women are showing up and like, well, if I just if I just work hard enough, they'll see how hard I work and then they'll give me a break. And like, believe me, I did that. That doesn't work. Right. We know that. <laughs> and this is like I remember the very first time I was um, promoted to vice president. Like it's such a huge big deal. Right. You've gone through the black ball, white ball process. You know, there was a couple of times I was spun up for promotion and I didn't get it. And then you get it. And you're just like, oh, my God. And I was called up to this meeting. And I worked for the chairman of international or I reported to the chairman of international and I was called up to this meeting and it was like such a big deal. It was on the executive floor. And I was, you know, like my ego is like huge. And I didn't, it, but it was a meeting that had nothing to do with international. And I remember thinking, that's weird. Why am I, why am I invited to this? And what I learned very quickly was that as long as I showed up for all these meetings, I got the work. <laughs> I was like, Oh, I'm the new workhorse at this level now. Now I'm still getting all the work. Why is that happening? Because I kept showing up for this stuff and I wasn't taking the time to understand what the chairman really wanted. And I didn't have this knowledge at that time. So again, I just kept showing up and working hard, working hard, hopefully that, you know, he would eventually give me a break. And of course he's not, he's just going to keep giving me more work because I'm getting it off at his back and he's relieved. So, so this was kind of my first inkling of like, oh, maybe getting promoted to vice president isn't going to help me work less. Hmm, maybe I need to figure out a different way to navigate this career. Um, but it took me quite some time to learn that. It took me years, actually, before I started studying human behavior and actually understanding this. Um, but what I was going to say was that, you know, what, what we're really trying to do here is, is understand at a very high level, especially when you're, you're working in a leadership capacity, that you've really got to move, the, you've got to shift the fo your focus off of you and onto other people and really start digging in and understanding what they truly need, what their behavior is and what's going on. Oh, and I was going to talk about like toxic bosses and things. So, you know, if you have a toxic boss, if you have a boss that uses bullying techniques, if you have a boss who just keeps um, throwing things at you, what are they, what's going on there, right? Like we were just talking um, with a client and she's in a situation where she's working in a startup. The startup is not doing well. They brought in a new CEO. The new CEO is just piling on work. I mean, the whole team, like everyone's staying till midnight every night. It's just insane. And so, okay, well, what's going on for that CEO? Well, that CEO is coming in to save the sinking ship, huge ego, huge purpose, right? Like this, she's got some massive um, things that she needs to accomplish here, but the way she's doing it isn't effective. She's burning out her team because we know it doesn't matter how many midnights you stay up, there's just gonna be another issue. Like as soon as we get this issue resolved, there's another issue and another issue, another issue, right? We know that. And so what we were talking about with our client was like, well, you have to show up differently because she needs you to be strong and say, hey, look, this isn't working. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna break this down because I know you are looking to come in here and have impact and save the sinking ship. Here's how we're gonna need to do it. 
right? But what did I just do? I just acknowledged her needs. What does she want? I get it, right? Instead of saying, no, we can't do that. I can't stay till midnight tonight. No, I got to go home and be with my kids or whatever. I'm saying, look, I understand what you need. And I understand very clearly what we have to accomplish here. We've got to save the sinking ship. And I understand that this is your job and you've been brought in to do this. Here's how we need to do that. And we need to rescope here, rescope here. And this is what needs to happen. And I will touch base with you again in a week, but this is how we're moving forward, right? And so you're giving that person a little bit of what they need, but you're rescoping so that you're not killing yourself and creating a, um, what do I want to say, a habit or, or sort of like this new working environment where everyone's always going to work till midnight whenever the CEO snaps their fingers. Like you can't do that. Same thing with a, like a boss that bullies, right? So that bullying boss may have a belief that I've got to behave in this way to be a good boss. I have to always critique or that boss has learned to intimidate through fear, right? And so they bark a lot. Well, again, you got to remove that fear-based psychology in you that says like, oh my God, oh my God, why is he barking? And, and ask, why are you barking? I'm, I'm confused. You look like you're really upset about this, Dave, Susan, whoever. So tell me a little bit more. What's, what's upsetting you? Are you worried about the shareholder meeting? Are you worried about your boss? Um, did your dog get run over by a car? Tell me what's going on so I can help you. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's all it is. It's just like you've got to get really focused on um, them and then they can relax into that conversation a little bit more once you've got it out on the table. And now you can say, OK, now that I understand what you need, let me get some thought into this and I'll get you back on how we're going to deliver this versus, oh, you need this done. Let me go do it. OK. And so do you see what I'm doing? This is I mean, you can work for really toxic bosses and they can just love you once you do this like that. To me, give me a toxic environment any day of the week. You will just sail right through this. And while other people, sadly, will still be struggling in that environment, you will just sail right through, continue to get promoted, continue to get more money, continue to enjoy a fulfilling career because you will be navigating it and you'll be in control because you will understand what's going on behind the curtain with people. Does that make sense? Awesome. All right, guys. So thank you for showing up for this broadcast again. Um, you know, it is entirely possible uh, to, to enjoy a very high quality of life, um, a very yummy paycheck and an incredibly powerful, demanding, um, successful career and not have to be trading off, right? And that's what I want every woman to understand is that so much of what needs to happen is inside of us that needs to change. Sure, sure we can change our jobs. We can get more nannies. We can buy more crock pots, all that. I love the time hacks. Believe me, I get it. But when we're talking about living a life that you are truly feeling joy, that you're truly feeling excited about, you're like, yes, I cannot believe this is my life. You, you have to get behind the curtain of your own psychology and human behavior as well as others. And so hopefully this series of broadcasts is helping you see that and seeing how powerful it can be once you understand how to do this. So thanks guys for showing up for the broadcast. Again, if you um, are at an apex of your career where you've kind of met that crossroads and you're like, I need to move further or I'm going to burn out and I'm, I'm, I'm going to break, then jump on the phone with our team, right? Let us help you figure out a game plan for your career so you can have a beautiful life along with an amazing career. Thanks everyone. It's been great talking with you.